Hello and welcome. He made his professional mark early on with an Oscar for one of his first cinematic efforts and went on to make the gripping look into the ironic life of the late Ugandan dictator Idi Amin. This week on One on One, meet the award-winning film and documentary maker Kevin MacDonald. As a young Scottish boy growing up in Glasgow, he didn't have any real sense of the film history within his own family. Kevin MacDonald's grandfather, the Hungarian-born but quintessentially British filmmaker, Emeric Pressburger, was famous for a string of big screen hits in the 1940s. He eventually proved to be the inspiration for the young MacDonald to explore the film medium, quickly making a name for himself with dramatic documentaries, mostly based around people. His hits included the Oscar-winning One Day in September in 2000, based on the killing of Israeli athletes at the 1972 Munich Olympics, and the 2003 BAFTA-winning film Touching the Void, reliving a disastrous climbing expedition in the Andes in 1985. In 2006, MacDonald received acclaim for his offbeat look at the life of the late Ugandan dictator Idi Amin in The Last King of Scotland continuing to prove that Kevin MacDonald can add an intriguing twist to a look into the lives of others. Kevin, thanks for the time. It's good to have a chance to chat with you. Very nice to be here. Now, by all accounts, you're, you're a pretty normal guy in, in what is a very unusual industry in some ways for that kind of person. Aren't you supposed to be the screaming, shouting, you know, demanding type? Are you in the wrong business? <laughs> I don't think I'm in the wrong business. I think because I come from documentaries, and in documentaries we're not screamers and shouters because we can't be, because uh, we have to be nice to people to get the stories out of them, um, as you probably know yourself. You know, you have to be, you have to be nice to the people you're, you're, you're making the films about. And um, my attitude to when I go into making a feature film I kind of take the same attitude as I do with documentaries, which is that I want to see what other people can do and kind of nurture them and get the best out of them. I'm not a kind of director who wants to have everything just so exactly like that. I want to see what other people will bring. Well, how do you cope with the, the big egos and the talent, you know, the, the way the talent behaves then? Well, you know, actually, I've only worked with one actor who was very, very difficult, and I won't mention his name. Um, but actually, I've found that every other actor that I've, I've ever worked with um, you know, the, 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 the people think that actors aren't human beings, and I used to think that too, because this can be quite strange. But um, actually, if you can form a, a friendship and a, and, 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 and a kind of direct relationship with them, I find that um, you, know, you, can get, you can get what you want, because they want to make a good film too. And um, uh, I think most actors, actually, the ego is all about protecting themselves. It's all about um, when they don't feel secure. And if you make them feel secure, then everything's usually fine. Now, you were born in Glasgow in Scotland, mm -hmm. uh, and actually you were born into a family that has strong links with the movie industry. Yes. Your uh, grandmother was uh, actress Wendy Orme, and your, your grandfather was uh, the legendary Hungarian-born uh, English filmmaker, yeah. Americ Pressburger. Yeah. At what age did you have a sense of being in a film family, so to speak? Well, not really, because I think my, um, my uh, grandparents had stopped being involved in the film industry long, long ago. Um, my grandfather was, a, was a, you know, a little old man living in a thatched cottage in Suffolk. He seemed, you know, he was a quintessential Englishman, except he had an incredibly strong Hungarian accent <laughs> his entire life, which he couldn't shake. Um, and Hungarians, as you know, have the strongest accents of anyone. And um, uh, so it was only really actually after he died, and I started to read the obituaries of his films. And he made films that are now considered to be classics in the 30s and 40s and 50s, things like The Red Shoes is probably the most famous ballet film. And I began to appreciate those films, and I actually ended up writing a biography of him, which um, Faber and Faber published in England. And um, that writing that book, of course, entailed me watching a lot of movies, watching a lot of old films that were his and other people's movies to get the context. And that made me fascinated by movies. And so indirectly, you know, he got me into movies, but not, not through anything that he did at the time when he was alive. Um, but I, I, I look back at his movies, and of course, they're made in the golden age of cinema. They're made at a time when everyone went to the movies once or twice a week. And uh, something about that magic that that era had and the, the way they approached movies has, has, has gone, unfortunately. So prior to sort of discovering this, this sort of legend in your family, um, what did you think of in terms of career? What, what did you plan to be, so to speak, when you grew up? Well, I always wanted to be a journalist. Um, and I went, to, I went to university and studied English literature, and then um, uh, I, I wanted to leave and get a placement somewhere, get, 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 you know, get my first f foot on the ladder in, in, in journalism. But it was the early 90s in England, recession, nobody was hiring. 
The, so the Guardian wouldn't have you. The Guardian wouldn't have me, alas. That was my natural home. So uh, I, um, I started messing around with a camera. And uh, I, I, my brother is also in film. He's become a film producer. He produces a lot of films with Danny Boyle, things like Train Spotting. This is Andrew McDonald. And uh, The Beach with Leonardo DiCaprio and films like that. Anyway, so we started messing around with cameras together just as a sort of hobby. And then one of the things we, we um, made got seen by the BBC. And they said, why don't you make a little five minute film or a 10 minute film? And they liked that. And one thing led to another. And I started making documentaries and found I loved it. Because of course, it's, making documentaries is really like, Journalism, yeah. in a sense, you know, you're 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 led by your curiosity, and you're trying to find out about subjects that you're you're passionate about, and uh, so that's what I did. And then, after a while, I got a bit, felt a bit restrained by working for the BBC or Channel Four in the UK, where where you know documentaries are 50 minutes long and they have to have ad breaks and all that kind of thing. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to make a film like Hoop Dreams, which had just come out, which is a great feature documentary about basketball, or um, When We Were Kings, which is a documentary about Muhammad Ali and the, and the rumble in the jungles, I year 74. And those had just come out in the cinema. And I thought, wow, you can make a documentary for the big screen. Um, and a documentary that is as entertaining as any fiction film you would see. So I thought, I'm going to want to make documentaries like that. And so I made two or three documentaries that were aimed at, at the big screen, including a film Touching the Void, which was very successful, and um, another film called One Day in September. I'll get on to some of the films in a moment. Mm. How did your parents, uh, sort of, how, first of all, how did your parents sort of influence you? What, were they, what did, hopes did they have for you? And then how did they regard your sort of shift into this area? Well, I don't know. My, my, um, my father um, was in, in sheepskin, if you can imagine such a thing, in Scotland. <laughs> so he was not anything to do with the film <laughs> business, he was not at all. He had, a, he had, a, he had, a, he had a, a sheep farm and a sheepskin tannery, if you can imagine. And um, my, my mother uh, lives in, who was Emmerich Pressburger's daughter, um, she had separated herself from the film industry as well and, and, and lives in Canada now, actually. And um, so I don't think there was any expectation that we would go into films, but both my brother and I did. I don't know whether that was something genetic or just because maybe because you know that somebody in your family has done it, you think, oh, that's a possible thing to go into. Um, but we certainly, we grew up, well, you know, couldn't have been further away from, from that world. Can you recall the, the, the challenge you faced when you first tried to direct uh, a you know, documentary, first actually got behind the, mm -hmm. the lens and said, listen, this is what I want out of it. Could you, do you remember the actual, uh, what the difficulties you faced? Well, I think there's diff different difficulties I've faced. One when doing documentaries and one when doing first fiction film. I think doing the first sort of big documentary I did was a film called One Day in September, which was a, a, a kind of quite hard-nosed investigation into the Munich Olympic Games massacre of 1972, trying to find out really what happened at that, at that infamous event. And I remember sitting opposite some you know, retired and very aggressive uh, German police officer and him just not giving me an inch and not responding to any of my questions, not giving anything. And I remember, the, I remember thinking, I, I can't do this, I can't do this. And then I actually got, I got angry and I started being aggressive back to him. And I suddenly found that actually he started justifying himself. And once he did that, of course, he was op he'd opened himself up. And, it, and I suppose it taught me a big lesson about documentary, which is that you never know quite how, what is going to open people up. You don't know what attitude. You think it's always going to be the softly, softly approach. But sometimes, sometimes it's not. And, but it taught me more than anything else that actually, I think deep down, everybody wants to tell their story. And the camera acts as a kind of um, uh, amanuensis, as a sort of hypnosis um, allowing people to, uh, to tell more truthfully their stories than maybe they would otherwise, I think. I think people often speak more truthfully in front of the camera than, than they would off the camera, which is a really counterintuitive thing. Your, your uh, documentary, the One Day in September, which was focused around the 1972 attack on Israeli athletes at the uh, Munich Olympics, won you an Oscar. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a, that's a major defining moment, I guess, in your career. And how did things change after that? How much easier did it get? Well, I think, the, you know, in England, the equivalent of winning an Oscar is getting a knighthood, I always think, you know, because thereafter you're always called, you know, sir, whatever, whatever, and, and every newspaper article refers to you, everybody, you know, that it's, it's, it's something that's with you forever and denotes a certain stature. In, in America, if you win an Oscar, I see it's, often, it's, it's the same thing. I find that, you know, I can be mentioned in a newspaper article in a completely different con context, and it always says Kevin McDonald, 
Oscar winner. And I think that sort of sums it up in a way. It sort of it, it raises you um, in, in stature in some way. And um, that makes it, it opens doors for you. But of course, I won an Oscar in documentary. And particularly in those days, more than 10 years ago now, documentaries were very much the poor relation of fiction film. They still sort of are. I mean, most Hollywood producers would probably never seen a documentary and, and, and certainly wouldn't be interested. But then, of course, along came Michael Moore and made Fahrenheit 9-11 and other great films. And, and, and those films made a lot of money. So suddenly people were like, oh, people in Hollywood were, oh, maybe actually documentaries are, are, are a thing to be into. Well, Touching the Void in uh, the 2003 movie uh, caused quite a stir. I mean, it's fantastic, atmospheric, strong movie. Uh, talking about life and death challenges for these two, two climbers in 1985 in the Andes. It caused a stir, I mean, among the climbing community as well because of some of the choices they faced and among the public in, in terms of general debate. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Well, at, at the heart of this story, which is about two climbers who, when very young, in their early 20s, went up a particularly difficult mountain, an unclimbed mountain in, in, in the um, Cordillera Huayawash in Peru, the Peruvian Andes, and they um, got to the top of the mountain, and then shortly after starting to descend, one of them broke his leg. And it left them with a very difficult position, in a very difficult position, because was the one who hadn't broken his leg going to help the other one down or not? And he decided he would, and they started helping him down. They spent all day. It was a storm. It was a horrendous, horrendous uh, situation. And then, just as it was getting dark, he lowered his friend, the one with the broken leg, over a cliff without knowing there was a cliff there. And this man, Joe Simpson, was dangling in midair and his friend Simon was holding on to the rope above and he held on and held on and held on for up to an hour and then he had to face the decision do I cut the rope on this man and let him go to his death or do we both go and of course he decided take my knife and cut the rope and Joe Simpson went disappearing down the cliff and as far as Simon knew was dead um, but extraordinarily Joe didn't actually die. He, he, he fell through some soft snow into a crevasse deep in the ice and amazingly managed to, with a broken leg and totally mashed up, managed to crawl back to the base camp they came from. I think three or four days it took him. So it was an extraordinary tale of survival, but also a film which for me was important because it touches on questions of faith and I think you know, can you believe it? Can you believe in a god when you're put in that sort of situation? When you're not normally a believer, can you? Can you know? How do you cope when you don't believe in a in, in a in a divine presence? When you're put in that sort of situation, do you crack? Where do you find the strength to go on? So there were lots of sort of bigger questions, profound questions, um, which it's were a, important it's a to me. Devastating choice to have to cut. Uh, a line which your friend's dangling off. And the thing is, you said it for Simon, who had to cut the line, or chose to cut the line, yeah. it haunted him afterwards. Yeah, Simon, Simon um, really was, uh, uh, had broken a taboo in the climbing world. And he was um, a bit of an outcast for some time after, after this happened, even though Joe didn't blame him. Joe told everyone, you know, I would have done the same thing. But it seemed like it's such a stark kind of um, a, a example of, 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 a, of a kind of ethical choice that, that you know you can't really imagine anything more stark than that you know do I cut the rope on my friend and send him to what I think is a certain death or do I not do we both go or just do it do I kill him and you know none of us would like to face that sort of, that sort of scenario so dramatically it was a brilliant story for turning into a film now your 2006 uh, sort of big fictional story mm -hmm. um, was uh, The Last King of Scotland, mm -hmm. a very atmospheric movie. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that was, you know, because it was set in Uganda at the time of Idi Amin's rise to power and so on. A lot of people tried to dissuade you filming that in Uganda, but you decided to go ahead. What difference did that choice make? Well, I think it made a, it made a huge difference to the atmosphere of the film and to the authenticity of it. Um, we were able to film in the parliament building where Amin had actually been. We were able to film... Uh, at his lakeside house. We were able to film using his actual bulletproof limo. We found his bulletproof limo filled with rats, literally, who had eaten all the cabling and everything. But it was sitting in somebody's garage, this sort of stretch limo. And we got it out, we fixed it up, and we used it in the film. So and we even found, actually, somebody came out of the woodwork and said, oh, I've got Idi Amin's medals. I went into the state house, he said, when, when he was overthrown, and I stole his medals, do you want them for the film? So we used his medals in the <laughs> film. Because he was famous, of course, for having row upon row upon row <laughs> yeah, of medals. That's right, that's right. All given to himself. All given to <laughs> himself, his own orders, exactly. 
The um, in terms of any lessons learned from making that kind of movie, yeah. uh, what, what was it you came out with that from that film? Well, I, I think I came out with with um, a couple of different lessons. One was that to if you make something in the real place, if you make something in as authentic a way as possible, I think it has textures and levels of complexity and interest that you, you can't achieve just through your imagination. I mean, on that film particularly, we had people working on the crew whose parents had been killed by Idi Amin. And so that allowed me to feel all the time, am I, you know, because there's a comic element to this film, but, you know, am I overstepping the mark? Is this appropriate? And, and they would say things. They would stand up and they would say, you know, he wouldn't have said that. Or, you know, actually a better line for that moment would be this. The funny thing about Idi Amin, though, is that Everybody you speak to in Uganda about him, you say, so did you ever meet Amin? Or what do you remember about Amin? And they go, oh, funny thing about Amin. I remember the time when, and he'd tell a funny story. And then they go, yeah, but he killed my uncle. And it's this, the, that was, was so fascinating to me about it, is the way that comedy and tragedy were so intermingled in a way that I'd never actually experienced before. And that was, that was what made that particular story so, so unique and, 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 and fascinating. You had two wonderful actors there, James McAvoy and Forrest Whitaker, too. Yeah, I mean uh, that was that was uh, uh, really lucky to have someone like James McAvoy to play that role, because it's a kind of thankless task. Slightly, the showy part is Forrest Whitaker's part playing the Amin, you know, it's a larger than life bravura kind of performance. But James McAvoy um, has is the thread through the film, and he's a kind of an unattractive person. He's he, the character is quite unattractive. He's 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 somebody who. Um, is actually willing to um, really turn a blind eye to atrocity in order to continue having a rather nice time himself. You know, it's a sort of I'm all right, Jack kind of mentality that he has. And James pulls that off while at the same time being incredibly sympathetic and, and fun to watch, which is, which is really difficult. You've been very ambitious with a project called Life in a Day, a YouTube project, very unique actually, uh, where thousands upon thousands of strangers uh, from around the world send you film clips they've recorded. Where, where did that, that idea come about and what, were you, what do you expect it to, to, to do? Well, you know, I'd made three fiction films in a row and I was missing documentary. And then this idea came up, a, a, a producer friend of mine came up with the idea and came to me and said, what do you think? Should we approach YouTube with an idea to make a, make a film? And that's what we did. We, 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 we went to YouTube and said, look, can we use your, um, your, your, your site as a, as a tool, really, to make a movie, where we ask anybody in the world who wants to be involved to film on the same day, on the 24th of July, it was uh, 2010, um, and to tell us about their life, really, and then upload that footage. And then the idea is that we're going to make a film which is a kind of portrait of the world in one day using some of the best characters from around the world, but also using sort of little snippets of lots of people. I, mean, I think there's gonna be 500 or so different individuals in the, in the film, in a 90 minute film. Um, but the idea originated actually from a, a well, the idea, from, the idea for me originated um, from um, uh, something that happened in the 1930s and 40s in Britain called Mass Observation, which uh, a, a poet and filmmaker called Humphrey Jennings started. And Mass Observation was a, 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 an idea whereby people were asked around Great Britain to write diaries all on the same day. And there were about a thousand volunteers who would write a diary about their ordinary life. And then those diaries would be put into a, into a book about that day. And they'd also ask them questions, things like, you know, what have you got on your mantelpiece? What's in your pockets? What graffiti did you see today? So I thought there's something very interesting in that idea, the kind of anthropology um, using not the written word, but using cameras in our case. And um, just to sort of analyze the what may seem like banalities to you, but actually when taken as a whole, I think turn out to be quite significant. You know, what we, one of the questions that we ask people is, what do you got in your pockets? And the extra, extraordinary things you get out of people's pockets and the stories they tell you about them, it gives you such an insight into them. Although a lot of that material was unusable, mm -hmm. it was amazing how willing people were to be intimate with their details, how, how much they gave away about their lives. I think that's the, the, the extraordinary thing that happens when people film themselves, when they feel they're in control, is that they will film themselves on the toilet. They will film themselves uh, when they're dying of cancer. They will film themselves at the moment they're being rejected by the one they truly love, which is a clip we have, somebody saying, I'm going to propose to this person today, and then she rejects him. And people, I think, 
would never allow that kind of stuff to be, to, to be recorded by a film crew. But if they feel they're in control of it, then they'll, they'll do it. And then they're inord, in, inordinately generous in sharing that with everybody else, which is also, to me, extraordinary. It's one of the features of YouTube and of the internet as a whole is that there is this whole generosity of spirit. That people were actually willing to give their time in order to create something for other people to, to enjoy and, and just as a, as a pure expression, I think. You, you um, in terms of uh, what you found from that, though, I gather, is that there's a uniformity in, in, in people around the world, no matter where they are, no matter what their status. We share more in common than we have different. Isn't that right? So we um, have all basically got the same things um, that preoccupy us, you know, babies, love, illness, death. And that's really kind of the basics of life, the fundamentals of, of human existence. If you really ask people what's important to you, what preoccupies you, what's on your mind, you know, we can all talk about, oh, our hobbies, and our this, and our that, but really, when it comes down to it, we all are preoccupied by the same simple, simple things. So actually, the process of making this film has been, for me, quite an eye-opener and, and made me actually much more optimistic about humankind, in a way. Actually, it's made me feel that, you know, we are all one. You yourself uh, married with kids, three boys, mm -hmm. the family. Um, it's, it's a very demanding business, the film world. How do you balance personal and, and professional life? Is <laughs> it easy? No, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. I, you know, every feature film I've done, I've been away for at least six months and maybe, maybe more from my three young kids and my wife. And that's very tough on, on them and tough on me. And I think uh, you can't go on doing that. And actually, I'm trying to do more things at home that base me in, base me in London. Um, but of course, if you're ambitious and you want to do interesting, interesting projects, you, you, you can't stay in, at home forever. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, I think for all film people, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, real, it's a real problem. And um, you know, there's a reason why so many failed marriages and <laughs> one thing and another in, the, in, in, in our business. In terms of uh, unlimited budget, unlimited opportunity, if you could take on a project, do you have anything in mind? Well, you know, if I had an unlimited budget, there is a project that I'd like to do, but I don't think anyone will ever finance it because it's, it's probably so, um, uh, so expensive and so abstruse. But there's a, there's a wonderful Viking saga um, or a novel that is a kind of masquerading as a Viking saga, written in the 1940s, called The Long Ships, that a friend introduced me to a few years ago, which I think would make the most brilliant film. But uh, so far, nobody's, nobody's bitten on that. So that's my, dream, that's my dream project. That or Cortez's Conquest of Mexico, that would also be a great film. I would love to do that movie. But again, it's vast, and various people have tried that one, but they, they nobody succeeded. And you're still young in your career, and you've achieved a lot and a lot of awards. But if if I could ask you what, how you'd like to be remembered or what you'd like your legacy to be, what would you say? <sighs> legacy. That seems such a big, big concept. Um, I, th I think I think you know what I really have found I enjoy is mixing documentary and and drama, not just in my career, you know, doing both, which I think is, I, I have such fun doing both. I don't see why so many filmmakers only do one or the other. I, I think it's, I think they both give you some t totally different pleasures. Um, but also just in terms of bringing some of the elements of documentary into, into fiction, trying to create things that have a, a reality or a sense of authenticity about them. Um, it's telling a story, really. Yeah, I mean, obviously, to, to have made some good films. I mean, that's the thing. To, if you can look back in 40 years' time and say, you know what, I made some good films. Those were good stories, and they stand up. I'd, I'd like to watch that film now. And that's, you can't ask for more than that. We'll see whether I managed to achieve that. And your grandfather will be proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> if I, yes, if I achieve it. His films are still watched. You know, They just re-released The Red Shoes, actually. Martin Scorsese paid for a restoration of the film, and it's beautiful. It showed at Cannes last year. And, that made me made me very proud. That actually puts puts your own, you know, small career into its into its context. You know, if you can have a film that's lasted uh, 60, 70 years and still still entertains people, that's, that's quite something. And Kevin, I wish you luck. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you.